Masada, a desert fortress like none other. There was a rock not small in circumference, wrote Josephus, and very high. It was encompassed with valleys of such vast depth downward that the eye could not reach the bottom. Upon the top of the hill, Jonathan the high priest first of all built a fortress and called it Masada, or Herod. Also built a wall around the entire top of the hill there were erected upon that wall 38 towers, each of them 50 cubits. War 783. Herod knew when to call upon the protection of Masada. When his rival, the Hasmonean Antigonus, became part of a plot to unleash the Parthians on Judea and Herod's fortunes plummeted, it was to this lofty plateau fortress that he dispatched his mother and sister, as well as Miriam, his betrothed, his future mother-in-law, and additional wives and followers, numbering some 800 in order to ensure their safety. But it was far more than an armed camp to which these noble women and their retinue were dispatched. In fact, rather than call Masada a fortress, scholars now prefer the word fortified palace. Herod must have loved personally supervising Masada's construction. Though Mason's marks in Hebrew show the workmen were local, the style suggests that these builders had trained in Rome or in the construction of some of the mansions in Pompeii. Artist's Rendering of Masada and Herod's Time Here was also a road dug from the palace, for the road on the east side could not be walked upon for reasons of nature and for the western road. He built a large tower at its narrowest place, which too could not possibly be passed by. Wars 783. Could Herod, consummate collaborator with Rome, ever have imagined the use to which his opulent palace would eventually be put? In 66 CE, a Jewish political sect known as the Sicarii, extreme in their opposition to Rome, broke into Masada to obtain weapons stored there. Forced out of Jerusalem by their political opponents, the Sicarii continued their battles from Masada, remaining there even after the temple lay in ruins and the war was all but over. But when the Romans finally turned their attention to the insurgents, even Herod's massive fortifications could not help them. In the spring of 73 CE, Roman siege machines breached Masada's wall, only to discover that the Sicarii had taken their own lives and the lives of their families, rather than surrender to the hated conqueror, the swimming pool, the storerooms, the hostel, the columbarium, the swimming pool. Herod's builders carved the building blocks from Masada's buildings from the mountain itself. Later, the quarries were used for various purposes, especially water storage. The size and shape of its pool rule out its use as either a ritual bath or a simple reservoir. The square niches in an adjacent wall reveal the recreational use of the pool. They were likely used for the storage of items of clothing belonging to bathers. The storerooms. According to Josephus, the storerooms built by Herod contained all things necessary for a siege, War 784. The excavator, Prof. Yigel Yadin, reports the discovery of various types of vessels, oil, wine, and flour jars, each with their own distinctive shape. The hostel. This complex is of a type common throughout Europe in the Roman imperial period. Such structures housed officials plying the famed Roman road system in the fulfillment of their duties. The complex, located near the eastern entrance gate of Masada, consisted of nine apartments grouped around an open-air courtyard and may have provided housing for members of Herod's entourage or other visitors to the fortress. The Columbarium. A round tower on the south side of Masada is believed to have been a dovecote. The raising of pigeons served many purposes in the Herodian era, among them for sacrifice in the temple and for the use of their droppings for fertilizer. The columbarium tower at Masada could have had purely decorative purposes with white doves flying to and fro, adding another pleasing dimension to the lush garden that apparently graced the south sector of Masada. The Northern Palace. The Northern Palace. The Northern Palace looking northeast. The middle level of the palace. Lower level of the Northern Palace. Perhaps the most magnificent edifice on Masada, the three-tiered northern palace served as the royal residence. The northern palace was located close to well-stocked storerooms and the luxuriously appointed bathhouse. A watchtower stood guard over this entire strategic end of the plateau, where soldiers no doubt remained on duty round the clock to protect both the royal personages when in residence and their possessions. The palace was separated from the rest of the complex by its own high protective wall, penetrated by a narrow corridor that led to the private apartments on the top level of the northern palace. 
These rooms were richly decorated with frescoes and one was graced with a window. The lowest level of the palace was a banquet hall. It was surrounded by engaged columns and fresco covered walls. Between the columns were additional windows through which diners could enjoy the spectacular desert scape. A small bathhouse was also located at this level. In between the middle level was a tholos, a circular structure that may have been used as a kind of conservatory rest area. Herod must have ordered his architects to seek out the coolest spot on this desert mountaintop for his personal quarters, for the northern palace is bathed in cool breezes that sweep down from nearby wadis every hour of the day, and especially in the evening. Open balconies on each level ensure maximum enjoyment of the best climate conditions on the plateau. In such pleasant surroundings, Herod's fiancée, Miriam, her mother, and his mother would have passed an enforced retirement period during the precarious early days of his reign. Years later, when Herod's power was at its zenith, he may have invited his friend Marcus Agrippa, son-in-law of his patron Augustus, to Masada. Standing on the balcony of the Tholos, he probably basked in compliments he received on the design of his palace, so similar to Marcus Agrippa's own villa on the banks of the Tiber in Rome. From this vantage point, Herod could also show off his balsam groves, shimmering in the heat not far to the north at Ian Getty, a major source of the wealth that allowed him to construct the extravagant wilderness showcase that was Masada. Lower Level of the Northern Palace Frescoes on the Lower Level of the Palace A Corinthian capital found on the Lower Terrace The Bathhouse This bath was built against a wall of the dressing room after Herod's time. Columns supporting the floor of the steam room. This largest of Masada's bathhouses was adjacent to the northern palace and probably served the royal family and honored guests. Much of the material for the bathhouse, as well as the crew that constructed it, may have been imported from Italy, showing once again the care Herod took to precisely imitate Roman culture through its architecture. A courtyard paved with a simple black and white mosaic served as the palestra or exercise court associated with bathhouses. It led to a dressing room or a potitarium paved with usual triangular tiles made of limestone and slate laid point to base. From the dressing room, bathers would pass through the cold water room to a rest area called the tepidarium, where they could enjoy a rub down and on to the steam room, the caldarium. The steam room, whose vaulted roof was adorned with molded and painted plaster, was heated by a furnace above which a water reservoir was placed. The furnace was connected by lead pipes to a tub in the steam room itself. Heated air moved from the furnace into the space beneath the suspended floor and from there to hollow rectangular bricks that covered the walls. This system provided extra heat as well as keeping the walls dry as steam could not condense on the hot surface. The circulation of air also kept the wood-burning furnace going at full blast. Imprints of the tiles on the floor show it was richly decorated. Four chimneys released smoke and gases from the furnace to the outside. The bathhouse, therefore, was far from merely a place to cleanse oneself. It was an aesthetic experience, a cultural institution of which the steam room, regardless of the weather outside, which at Masada must have been stifling hot most of the year, was an inseparable part. Here one could pass time with friends and engage the power of adversaries. No doubt numerous lucrative business deals and more than one plot were hatched in the aromatic vapors of Masada's bathhouse. Water for the bathhouse and other needs was stored in cisterns like this, hewed from the solid rock. They were fed by aqueducts leading from Wadis, dry riverbeds whose water came from flash floods. Pastime of the rich and famous. Men usually visited the baths in the afternoon, while women went during the less popular morning hours. A variety of fragrant oils were applied during the massage that was an essential part of the bathhouse experience. Soap was a paste made from the fruit of the lapine plant. After the bath, both the person and his or her clothes would be anointed with fragrant oil from plants like crocus, myrtle, and cypress, or the costly nard. In the wealthy country estates of Italy, baths have often been discovered adjacent to the estate kitchen, sharing its stove as a heat source. It is possible that these facilities, cramped in comparison with the Masada bathhouse and other similar complexes, were used by slaves and servants because the larger baths were mainly reserved for the wealthy. In excavations of what have been defined as tenements, lower-class ancient homes in Rome, no bathing facilities at all have been discovered. The Western Palace If Masada's northern palace was Herod's home at Masada, then the open and reception areas, baths, kitchens, and guardhouse wing of the Western Palace, all surrounding a central courtyard, indicate that this opulent building was his business address. 
One of the rooms had four depressions in the floor, which Mascara excavator Yagel Yadin interpreted as devices to hold posts that supported a canopy over a throne. Walls may have been concealed with wall hangings, which archaeologists have identified as a thick layer of ash containing charred ropes and bronze rings. A second story of the Western Palace may have contained guest apartments and viewing terraces for the pleasure of visitors. In the Western Palace bathhouse, a mosaic common to others of the time combination bands of different widths, but of the same color with other designs. Mosaic from the Western Palace bathhouse. The Mosaic Artist. The stones or tesserae were cut with a hammer and chisel, mainly from limestone containing the desired hues, iron oxide for red and magnesium for green and black. Large, naturally flat stones were laid out to even out the workspace, on top of which lime and ash mortar were spread. While still wet, the mortar was incised by the mosaic master with the parallel lines between which the design would appear. Sometimes the design was painted onto the cement before the stones were laid by his apprentices. Mosaic floors were a common decoration for wealthy homes and public places in ancient Rome. Their appearance in Judea around the time of Herod is clear testimony of the cultural and economic allegiance to Rome established by his father and furthered by himself. In a city like Caesarea, the work of the mosaic masters would have been much in demand. Josephus records that Herod imitated everything, though ever so costly or magnificent in other nations. Herodian mosaics are characterized by black and white patterns as well as plain, colored bands interspersed with the more complex designs that served to emphasize them. Among the designs are the serrated sawtooth and a wave pattern thought to come from the Hellenistic world of the sea. Vine leaves, pomegranates, and grapes are unusual. Simple vine scroll is more common. The addition of the fruits may be some of the fruits of the land of Israel, which were among the earliest motifs in Jewish art. Rosettes, which appear often on stone carvings as well, are a more common design than any other. In the Roman world outside Judea, mosaics abounded in elaborate human and animal figures. But of all the Herodian era mosaics discovered in Herod's palaces at Masada, Jericho, Herodium, and Cyprus, not one contains human or animal figures. The reason for this is clear. Herod was well aware that imitating the human and animal images of the non-Jewish artistic world would anger his Jewish subjects as they contravened the second commandment. Such flouting of Jewish ritual even by the king contained the potential for violence that would disrupt the smooth running of his kingdom and bring the wrath of Rome upon him. It is therefore more than a nod towards Jewish tradition that Herod chose as a motif for this mosaic some of the seven fruits of the land of Israel mentioned in Deuteronomy 8.8. Mosaic from the Western Palace Bathhouse. Herod's Other Palaces. Jericho. Macarius. Herod the Great Builder. The golden age of Herod's rule included the construction of Caesarea with its port, one of the largest ports in the Mediterranean. He rebuilt and expanded the ancient capital at Samaria and expanded the old Greek town. Both Caesarea and Sebasti were named for Herod's patron, formerly Octavian, now called Augustus, the August one, Sebaste, in Greek. Both cities, as well as the town of Paneus, later Caesarea Philippi, contained huge temples to his patron. Among some 15 other building projects was the second largest palace in the world at Herodian. But the complex for which he is perhaps most famous, the largest building project of the Roman world of its time, was the Jerusalem Temple. Built on the self-same site, where the first temple had stood, which was on the site where David had purchased a threshing floor from Ornan, the Jebusite, the temple was a symbol of the presence of the Spirit of God among the people. It was also the symbol of everything that was enigmatic about this despotic ruler, right down to the gigantic golden eagle that he ordered placed over the temple gate. He purchased a thousand robes for the priests, but the garments of the high priest, to the latter chagrin, he kept in the Antonia fortress, allowing them to be worn only on the holy days, after which they would be returned to his keeping. During a famine, he once remitted a third of the taxes he collected to the people, but those same citizens were not permitted to meet, walk, or eat together, says Josephus. Herod watched everything they did, and when any were caught, they were severely punished, and many there were who were brought to the citadel Hyrcania, both openly and secretly, and were there put to death. And there were spies sent everywhere, both in the cities and on the roads. 
and for those who could in no way be reduced to acquiesce, he persecuted them all manner of ways. Antiquities of the Jews, 15, 366 to 368. Herod earned his epithet, the great, as a builder, while sorely lacking other virtues. Sardaba, Alexandrian, Hyrcania, Herodian, Caesarea. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. Acts 25, 4-5 Inscription mentioning the name of Pontius Pilate and a temple he dedicated to Tiberius in Caesarea. Herod built cities like Jerusalem and Caesarea Maritima in the style of the great Gentile cities he had known, though not as elaborate. He intended them to be inhabited by his Jewish subjects, and in constructing them, he strengthened the status of the Jewish communities in these places and also that of his own ethnic community, the Idumeans. Herod built Caesarea on a site that had been settled centuries before by Phoenician seafarers and had been known as Strato's Tower. When Augustus awarded him the area, Herod decided to turn Strato's Tower into his main seaport, as his son Philip would later do at Peneus, Caesarea Philippi. He named the city in honor of his patron, Augustus Caesar. The port Herod designated Sebastus the second time he honored Augustus by naming a place for him using the Greek form of his title. The ruins of Caesarea as seen today. Herod's Harbor, the Crusader Tower, Modern Port, Aqueduct, East Gate, Promontory Palace, Herod's Amphitheater, Cardo Maximus, Roman Theater. It took Herod 12 years to build the city. Like his other cities, Caesarea had two major focal points, the temple and the palace. Its underground drainage system was very elaborate and almost as beautiful, Josephus says, as the buildings above ground. The city boasted magnificent public structures, including a theater and a stadium where Herod initiated games that took place every fifth year and became world famous. Water needs for the city's some 15,000 residents were supplied by an aqueduct that transported water from springs in the foothills of the Carmel Range to the east tunneling where necessary, about 1,200 feet. The industrial zone of the city containing any workshops that would emit noxious fumes, like the Tanner's workshop, or noise of carts or machinery, was situated to the east so that prevailing winds would carry the smells away from the town. Rome's procurators established themselves at Caesarea and probably lived in the palace that Herod had built in his day in the wake of the chaotic reign of his son Archelaus when the Romans restored direct rule to the country, the northern aqueduct. In this context, we meet Caesarea in the New Testament. It was the home of the centurion Cornelius, the first Gentile convert to Christianity. King Agrippa I met his unpleasant death here. Later, Paul the Apostle was brought to the city as a prisoner and appeared before the procurators Felix and Festus and finally before King Agrippa II, after which he left from the Caesarea port for Rome to set his case before Caesar. It was in Caesarea that in 66 CE, the great revolt of the Jews against the Romans actually broke out when intercommunal strife between Jews and Greeks set off a riot, the shock waves of which emanated through the entire country. During the years of the revolt, Vespasian was quartered in the city. As a consequence of the revolt, the city lost its royal status and like the rest of the country, went into decline. In 79 CE, the cataclysmic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy brought tsunami waves to the shores of the Holy Land, laying waste to much of the town. Thus, by the end of the first century CE, much of the city had sunk back into the sand. This statue may have stood in one of Caesarea's pagan shrines. The theater. The walled city of Caesarea. In Herod's day, the population of Caesarea reached about 15,000. The amphitheater.